I guess you should have called. I did call earlier when using the phone. Earlier when was that? Or later when then I uh, le left a message. A message? What number did you call? Two, four, nine or five. Six, seven, eight. I can't hear you. You're trailing off. And did I catch a niner in there? Were you calling from a walkie-talkie? No, it was cordless. Mm -hmm. You know what? Don't. Not here. Not now. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today you'll learn the dirty industry secrets that you should know before you hire a financial advisor with the creator of Financial Gym, Shannon McClay. In our headline segment, stocks are selling off in one huge market. Should you be buying? We'll dive in. For our TikTok Minute, maybe a new perspective on student loans. Plus, a stacker who had better just call Saul, see hi and OG. And then I'll share some healthy trivia. And now, two guys who've been powerlifting together all morning to bring you the strongest personal finance around. I'm sorry, I just, I pictured you guys in those, like, little string tank top shirts. And it's, That's because we were. It screwed Keep me going. up, and you were all It's because we were. Oily. All right. We'll back that up a little bit. And now, two guys who've been powerlifting together all morning to bring you the strongest personal finance advice around. It's Joe. Oh, and oh, J -j 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 Hey there, stackers. Ducks right. We are here to <sighs> pump you up. You up. <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday morning so glad you're here with us you found us sit back relax welcome to the show that dares not just to cover one topic no we're gonna educate you on probably four different things today man the bar is high we got shannon mcclay here talking about the dirty underbelly of financial planning and wow. so much more including i think it's that dirty i shower every day <laughs> Well, every other day, mostly. OG thought the exact same thing I thought you were going to say. When you said dirty under, what was the next word you thought was coming, OG? Pants. Belly. <laughs> no, are you kidding me? Really? Belly. Unbelievable. You would think about dirty underpants, Mr. Brown Trout. I tried to cut to the commercial, but I think I think we still got the words in there. Less puerile Please. humor? We're just trying to move this ahead. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Oh, gee, you got another good joke? Yeah. Okay. So there's a monk, a priest. Wrecked him. Damn near killed him. <laughs> oh, that's a doozy. And we're back. We got Shannon McClay here. But first, a big headline. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Yahoo Finance. This is written Yahoo. by you remember Abishka those commercials? Vishnoi. Sorry? Yeah, never mind. Carry on. I'm just in my own little world over here. I'm just excited because QuickBooks <laughs> support help fix my problem today, and I am on cloud nine. It is incredible. Uh, something else incredible. China sell-off leads to a record $38 trillion gap with U.S. stocks. And uh, this piece reads, the value of China's stock market has never been this far behind that of the U.S. as the losses continue to pile up in a seemingly relentless equity route. The value of China's stock market has never, never been, never. Before they had a stock market. I know, yeah. isn't never a big word? The market capitalization of the U.S. stock market is now $38 trillion dollars. That is a lot of money, though. Greater than USA, that. USA, USA. Hong Kong and China put together a fresh record, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. Uh, China offers value, but catalysts are just not there, said Michael Liang, chief investment officer at Foundation Asset Management, Hong Kong. Meanwhile, the U.S. market has momentum and equity on its side. Growing divergence comes as steep losses paint a troubling picture of global investor sentiment toward the world's number two economy. At the same time, U.S. stocks have hit record highs, powered by a mega cap technology rally. Amid optimism, the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates this year and navigate a soft economic landing. Oh, gee, you know, it's funny. I was in an online forum and 
some investor was talking about <laughs> international stocks. Why would they talk about that in that forum? I'm sure Joe? that's the exact topic of the forum you were in, but carry on. <laughs> wondering about international stocks and why anybody would invest in these things. First of all, l l let's go that way. Is this more evidence that maybe I should be tilting even further toward the U.S. and away from international stocks? I think it's a great example of how you don't have any idea what actually is going to happen at any point in time relative to investment performance. I mean, it wasn't just a year ago that we were in the middle of, oh my gosh, this is going to be a major recession and the entire global economy is going to crater and yada, yada, yada. Market was down 20% the end of 2022. 23, it went up mostly in the last you know quarter of 23, which again, just proves the point that you can't time it out exactly right. I think it's a great time to look at your portfolio from a rebalancing standpoint and decide, does it make sense to rebalance? If you're trying to pick and choose different economies in different countries, I think you're going to miss it. I think being diversified by having a little bit of your money in China and a little bit of your money in Brazil and a little bit of your money in, you know, any every other economy for that matter is where the is where the win happens, not by trying to exclude or only include certain different economies. This doesn't mean then that it's time to go heavy into Chinese stocks. I mean, when stocks are down, it seems like, heck, man, let's load up. China's not going to be horrible forever, will they? But that's the point. You don't, you don't have any idea, right? We could have said the same thing in the late 80s and early 90s about Japan. Oh, it's down, down 30%. It can't get worse than this. And it just stayed there for a long period of time. I think there's a lot of demographic stuff going on in China, too, that people are, are somewhat concerned about. But if you look at the, the world through the lens of productivity and where does the productivity come from, obviously the vast majority of it comes from the U.S., but the Chinese economy has about the same output as the Canadian economy when you look at it in terms of you know, investment output. So your portfolio of China stocks should be about the same weighting as your portfolio of Canada stocks. But yet, for some reason, we look at China and go, well, I got to, you know, I got to have an overweight there or whatever. It's a big economy relative to the rest of the world. Yes. But relative to, you know, each individual place, it still represents a small percentage. And everything else is just trying to be market timing, which you can be successful at if you get it right. But also, I, I, I know we successful. generally don't do a lot of macro stuff here, but I am curious about your thoughts, either of you, on general economic impact if china continues to shrink if its economy continues to shrink do you feel like we're have a large enough domestic economy both from a production and supply line standpoint and other trading partners that we'd be insulated from that or do you see a big impact to us macro economically if they continue to go in the I don't think any of that actually matters because think about it from the company standpoint inside of those organizations or inside of those countries, right? So what is their responsibility? The, the, the companies that are producing goods and services in those economies that are doing well or not doing well have a duty to their shareholders and de facto to themselves because most of them are large shareholders of their own companies. So they're going to continue to try to find ways to produce their goods and services in a manner that produces success for their company. And you're seeing some of those things already, some you know different things, I should say, for example, Apple transitioning a bunch of production from China to India because Apple goes, hey, we can get a better deal. We can have a better outcome for our shareholders, for our you know stakeholders if we do it in this way. So I don't worry about any of those things because I just believe that all of those people that work at all those organizations are super focused on being productive in their own regard. And if that means I, I know people who have moved their companies from one country to another, their production facilities from one place to another over the last 20 years, because economically it made more sense to produce it in this place or this place. And that could be the same. You could say the same thing about the United States or Mexico or China or India or Canada or the U S there's, there's always going to be give and take, you know, with different exchange rates and tax rules and all that other sort of stuff. And so all those really smart people are going to try to make really good decisions about their individual company's results. You also look at from a macro perspective too, that uh, if we are 
getting supplies from China for pieces of things that Americans are buying in an economy where companies are struggling, it seems like we would have a better chance of securing better pricing from those from those companies, which should be a good thing. You know, what's amazing, OG, is, is that you mentioned Japan. This is a piece from the Wall Street Journal. Investors fleeing China are going big in Japan. Guess what's big in, guess what's big in Japan? Doug. <laughs> uh, Japanese cosmetics and pop culture have long been hot items in China. Japanese stocks less so. The fact that this is beginning to change. Chinese individual investors are piling headlong into Japanese shares as their own market flags, both the sign of the times and a big hint as to why Japanese stocks are suddenly doing so well in general. That's a phrase, OG, you haven't heard in forever. Japanese stocks doing well. And again, makes it very difficult to predict what's going to happen next. Like, really? Well, that's the whole point of all of this, I think, is to is to recognize that unless you're trying to do the market timing game, which again, some people are successful doing and some people are not, most are not, I should say, then your allocation to different places, no different than your than you think about your allocation to big companies or small companies in the United States, your allocation to countries should be based on what they produce, give or take, toward the global economy, not like, well, I think that, you know, the demographic shift in this country is going to affect this. Therefore, you know, once you start using the words, I believe, we believe, our economists think, as soon as you start reading that sort of stuff, it's just somebody's guess. That's just, you might as well just replace that with the word guess. My guess is, and that's fine. Your guess could be correct. Or you could just do it easy and own one of everything and not even worry about it. All this discussion, we've had so much discussion about China being strong and now China's weak. All these discussions about Japan being a stagnant stock market, Japanese stocks getting stronger, just reminds me of old guy, Sir John Templeton. <laughs> oh, gee. Sir John Templeton was, for people that don't know, a British American investor, philanthropist, founder of the Templeton Prize, if you've ever heard of Templeton Mutual Funds, but some great Templeton quotes. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Like Templeton would always take a phrase and would turn it around. And of course, he's, he's best known for saying, if everybody else is looking right, you look left. He says, if you want to become really wealthy, you must have your money work for you. I like that one. Self-improvement comes mainly from trying to help others. Think about that. If you want to help yourself, go help somebody else. It's impossible to produce superior performance unless you do something very different. That's totally OG, the Templeton way, was can't do what everybody else is doing if you want superior results. What he didn't say, though, was that being different also can come with some big risks. Yeah. Well, and back in the day, their big thing was having people on the ground in emerging economies, which made them successful. And back 30, 40 years ago, that helped in terms of information distribution, right? If you had a person in that community that could say, well, I'm watching this factory being built. You yeah. know, I'm watching the, the the widgets come out of the factory versus now everything is 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 so uniformly distributed in terms of information that from an efficiency standpoint, you don't gain a ton by investing a bunch in that local, you know, feel, which which was kind of their mainstay for so many years. I want to end on this Templeton quote. Bull markets are born on pessimism. Think about this. When everybody else is pessimistic, that's a great time. That's when the bull market's coming. Grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die in euphoria. When everybody's high-fiving themselves, the bull market's dead. Yeah. We will link to more fun from John Templeton and also from these pieces on our show notes page and also in the 201 where Kevin Bailey from our team dives deeper into all the topics we talk about on the show. It's always free and you can find it at stackybenjamins.com slash 201. Coming up next, <laughs> Shannon McClay is a longtime uh, financial advisor. She is the owner of a great company called The Financial Gym where OG back when they had a physical space, we actually had a meetup yeah. with a bunch of stackers in Manhattan. She was so nice to host us. New York city. Yeah. Shannon expanding nationwide and is on the show to talk about the, the difference between bad advice. The number one person I like talking to about all the bad advice we've heard and all the slimy financial advisors out there is Shannon McClay. And uh, Sh Shannon is always happy to shine a light on some of the ugliness out there in financial planning world and help point you to, uh, very much like OG does, 
toward uh, maybe safer water. So Shannon coming up next, but as a way to get there while she comes down to the card table, Doug, uh, what's today's trivia question? Hey there, stackers. It's your old pal, neighbor Doug. You know, we're almost a month into the year, and I'm proud to say that I'm still keeping up with my New Year's resolutions. I've been going to the gym three to five times a week, every week. Well, well, there were those two weeks that I only went once. And, uh, oh yeah, there was that one week where I didn't go at all. But, you know, other than that, I have stuck to a really strict regimen. I would have gone more than that, but I've been helping Joe's mom a ton which is its own kind of workout. Not like that. Whenever I do oh make God. it to the <laughs> Whenever I do make it to the gym, I like to focus on all the things no one ever thinks of so I can build muscles everyone else overlooks. To warm up, I do 3 laps around the inside of the gym while kicking a medicine ball ahead of me. And then I do 30 to 40 reps on the neck machine both sides. The main workout Depends on whether I'm focusing on glutes or pecs that day. Then, for my cool down, I walk an entire mile backwards on the treadmill. Kind of like that idea I got from OG's neighbor. You should see the looks I get from both women and men whenever I hit the gym. It's like they've never seen a man's butt look so good in jeans. Today's trivia question is, how much does the average person's wage increase after they add a workout routine? Is it A, 6 to 10%, B, 15 to 22%, or C, not at all? I'll be back right after I iron my sleeveless Barry Manilow concert tee for tomorrow's workout. Hey there, stackers. I'm future blue jeans model and guy with the strongest neck in Texarkana, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I've been thinking, I'm such a natural at the gym, I should get into personal training on the side. It seems selfish not to share my talents. Today's trivia question is, how much does the average person's wage increase after they add a workout routine? Is it A, 6 to 10%, B, 15 to 22%, or C, not at all? The answer? Prioritizing your body doesn't just increase your overall health, it also increases your overall wealth. Adding a consistent workout routine to your schedule can increase your income by 6 to 10%. At the rate I've been adding ankle muscle with all this backwards walking, I could be a millionaire by June. And now, here to teach you the dirty secrets of the personal finance industry, it's today's mentor, Shannon McClay. I'm so happy she's back in mom's basement with us. Shannon McClay's here. How are you? I am so great to be back, Joe. Thank you for having me. I told everybody ahead of time that there's nobody I like talking dirt about the uh, financial planning industry more with than Shannon. (laughs) I know because we both were in it. We're like two insiders who were in it who were like, what the hell is going on here? And then we got out. It's always so nice to talk to somebody else who who saw it, who knows it. it makes you feel less crazy, you know, because, you know, there's so many people there who think it's great. You would think, though, that we would have, you know, be shaking enough and be horrified enough about the industry. We're both pro advisor still. Oh, yeah. The right advisor. I'm pro the right advisor. The problem is they're a very small percentage of the population. In my opinion. Well, let's go there. Before we go to who the right advisor is, let's talk about some of the bad advisors because that's what everybody wants, right? Let's do the dirt. (laughs) Worst financial planning you've seen. Okay. So I have so many. Sorry. I'm like, which which one? Okay. We have a client who is 30. She's a 34-year-old woman doing well, you know, in her business. She came to us like probably came to the financial gym five years ago. And at that point, we weren't doing investing and she was building her business, she had about $2,500 to save a month. And we're like, great, here's what you could do. Go in a robo advisor, you know, because she had she had emergency fund already set. Now we got to prepare for all the other things coming up. So she said, oh, my family has a financial advisor. Why don't I ask them who I can work with? We're like, okay, great. You know, use your family advisor. So we check in. She has a check in, a quarterly review. Two quarters later, she's like, okay, I have uh, worked with the guy. Here's what he set me up in. So $2,500 a month of this woman's money is going to a whole life insurance policy. But why did I know this she is, is where a single this is woman. Going. Like I said, she was in her late 20s. And you know, you know these things. Once you start it, it's like the mafia. You can't get out. 
because you're not going to get cash value for at least what four like five ten years something like that like when you look at their yeah. table so you're in for a while we had client a whole other stories but anyway so we know she's in once she start once you start the policy you're in you're in we were like okay that would not be what we would have suggested but fine you got your guy so then a year later you know she's still with us we're helping her on the coaching side and the business side she's like my advisor's showing me an investment what do you think p.s it's another freaking one of these things like because she's got more money her business grown it's like he's suggesting she puts another nine hundred dollars into that we were like no for all the re- blah 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 and she was like okay um a year later she comes back to us because i guess you know she meets with him yearly she's like here's what he's telling me to do it's a structured settlement plan joe so she oh. wanted advice yeah her accountant told her to open a sep ira because she's got her, her business told her to put so it's retirement savings for this woman in her early 30s and he suggests a structured settlement plan we review it even first of all the prospectus or the information is there's no disclosure language anywhere i'm like this should be red flags right because anything that's registered or like monitored by the sec or finra or whatever that's going to have disclosure language no disclosure language and then there's a part of it that says average returns over time six percent this is this woman's retirement account she's 30 years old and he's suggesting she puts something in that's going to earn her six percent over the next 30 something years. And so be then, illiquid. Yeah. And, be illiquid and all the other things. Right. So right. I look, I'm like, finally, I'm, I'm so angry at this guy because now three times he's like kind of gotten bubbled up to me. So I look him up on broker check. By the way, people, if you have a, a broker, you somebody or a financial advisor, a financial planner, somebody you're dealing with, if you go to broker check, just Google broker check, it's a FINRA site. You can look up their name and look up if they've had disclosures or any kind of issues. So I look him up. P.S. It says he's been banned from the industry. Banned. I've never seen banned. Yeah. You and I both know there's not supposed to be selling anything. Yeah. Oh, well, he's still he's still active because all these things are insurance products. He's still active in Florida, like Florida State and the insurance side. It still says he's (laughs) because I went there because and I'm like, what? Literally, this guy's been banned. And and here's my issue. How are you banned from FINRA securities products, but you can still keep selling life insurance? Like, don't, did the two regulators not connect anywhere? That is incredible. By the way, for people that don't know, what's a structured settlement? It's when people are supposed like owed money that goes into a trust. So like they won a lottery or they have uh, some kind of deal where they're they're guaranteed funding from like a lawsuit or something like that. It, they're guaranteed a future stream of payments for whatever, like again, lottery or some kind of structured deal, but you can't get a lump sum. And so if you have, if you're entitled to this future flow of funds, you can sell those future fund flow of funds to somebody else and get cash up front. But it's very structured. There's a lot of these as all this like Money to, you know, Joe, you and I both know this. Whenever you hear structured, we know that that means money to whoever's structuring it. Right. And it means you're screwed to who's ever buying it. <laughs> well, a popular thing that I think maybe a lot of our stackers know is that artists will do this with their catalog. This was the whole right. Taylor Swift thing. Her her music got sold beyond her reach to a guy that she hated. So she went and remade all her music. He actually bought her catalog, kind of a similar thing there with the, because he's buying the income stream that these songs provide. And then the whole life insurance policy, frankly, A, it locks you up, B, it's forever. Mm -hmm. It can be a good thing for the right person who is incredibly conservative and thinks they need insurance Mm -hmm. forever, which is 0.01% of the universe Mm -hmm. of people. But from a 27 year old woman who is- No children, not married. No children, doesn't fit the box. No. Yeah. <laughs> What's even worse about this woman, Shannon, is that her parents rely on this guy too. Yes. So yes. multiple generations getting screwed yeah. by this product talker. Yeah. And then he's still reaching out to her. And this is the reason why I looked him up on broker check because she forwards the email. And I was like, this guy doesn't even have a signature. It's coming from a Gmail account. Like, what is happening here? Like, none of this is above board. And this is the thing that's so frustrating to me, Joe, that you know. His name is hotbroker126 at (laughs) gmail.com. Here's the thing that's so crazy to me and all of this is that frustrates me on behalf of all the 
millions of Americans who deal with people like this is that there's so many things that are, quote, legal, you know, but not necessarily right or like really in the investor's best interest that that investors don't know or like clients don't know. Like we we are telling this woman it's it's wrong, but she doesn't know she's trusting on the people in the industry yeah. to guide her. Like that's why she has an advisor. So you feel like because you have an advisor, you're protected. But like, I can't even tell you how many we have another client who also he had he's putting nine hundred dollars a month into a, a whole life insurance policy. He was 31 at the time, no kids or married. And I asked him, I'm like, why are you doing this? He's like, I have a friend who works for Northwestern Mutual. And that's all you need to hear. I honestly didn't even need him to say that. I I, I knew I was just yeah. like confirming what was going on. But so I said, OK, well, let's try to get out of this. Let's you know, do you have cash value? Like, because this is not a good thing for you. And he calls, he finds out he has zero cash value. He's been putting $900 a month for the last two years or year and a half, 18 months in this thing. He has zero cash value. So now he's got to make the Sophie's choice, right? Do I keep putting $900 a month into this thing? Or pay or, these huge surrender charges. Or or do I walk away? Yeah. Because right? he has enough money that it, like, or he's like, or just okay. walk away. And I've lost what, whatever $900 times 18 is. And he walked away. Probably a smart move over the long term, sadly. Yeah, he's been fine. He's recouped it. Like he went into a brokerage account and and invested the 900 into the the stock market and he's fine. But like he had to make that call. I mean, how horrible, right? It's like, again, a friend of a friend. He thought it was a good thing. And I said how and I understand when people I hate hearing how people say, I don't know why I signed up for it. It seemed a little fit. It seemed a little too good to be true. I said, look, they are trained. People who sell this are trained. It's almost like a cult, too. They're like, because they really believe it, that they are trained on how to sell these products. And I've personally had them sold to me. And I remember sitting through one of these things thinking like, oh, my God, yeah, why am I not doing this? $25 yeah. a month. Like, And all of a sudden, my like spidey senses were tingling. And I was like, wait, can I see the returns, to, you know, like the structure? And I realized that the IRR on this product between whatever age I was, 30 and 60, the IRR, the internal rate of return on it was like 2%. Mm -hmm. But from 60 plus, because once you're closer to dying, they start paying you more. And from that point on, it jumped. But I'm like, okay, so I'm going to earn 2% for the next 30 years. Forever? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds uh, like a great, <laughs> like a great deal for somebody, <laughs> maybe not me. You know, uh, the worst one that I saw, I had these lottery winners hire me because mm -hmm. they thought something was bad. Here's what was going on. He took the money from their lottery winnings. He put it into annuities. And by the way, not one annuity, Shannon, not one, which is funny because they could have taken it as an annuity directly from the, right. the lottery, the state, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he takes it because for everybody that doesn't know, an annuity is like a pension. And I call so, it a private pension, yeah. Yeah, it is. So he tells them, nope, take the lump sum. Annuities have these commission breakpoints where the advisor gets paid less. Well, not advisor, the salesperson gets paid less if they go over that breakpoint. So the commission mm -hmm. goes down if it's, you know, $30 million in annuity. So these people have like 30 different annuities, Shannon, just what? annuities all over the place so that he could max his commission. Oh, no, no, no. It gets worse. <laughs> oh, no. Then, and these annuities all have surrender charges. Yeah. He sets up income streams from those annuities every year, including surrender charges. These people are paying surrender charges every year to take money out of these initial annuities and put them into different annuities. Oh my God. Bam! It's like an annuity pyramid scheme. I have never, <laughs> 16 years as a financial planner, Shannon, I never once besides this time told somebody they had to sue somebody. And I said, this is, I'm sorry, this is a lawsuit. Like, this is clearly a lawsuit. Just absolutely horrible. I've, you said people get sucked into this a lot. I want to ask about a term that a lot of people, I think that don't know better, mm -hmm. tell people to ask. I want to ask you about interview questions here in a second. But first, I want to discuss this word, mm -hmm. fiduciary. Oh, I knew, I knew that was a word you were going to say. I knew it. It is an important word. Yeah. But what's wrong with the whole fiduciary thing right now? <sighs> So here's my issue with fiduciary. Nothing against CFP, but they have done a really good job marketing. The CFP board has done a really good job marketing on behalf of all their people who they charge money to get the CFP designation. They have done a really good job marketing about a fiduciary because 
if you have a CFP, you are a fiduciary. You can be a fiduciary and not be a CFP. You could be an advisor at Merrill Lynch and be a fiduciary. But here's what I hate about the fiduciary thing. The standard is still really low. You know, like the, the fiduciary standard is like you're supposed to do something in the best interest of the client. But what I've seen and what what the SEC with FINRA allow is a pretty wide range of acceptable. That, that right there, Shannon, is my problem. Yeah. We say at the gym that our, our trainers are your BFF, your best financial friend. We said we're taking the BFF standard. So for our investments and our investment portfolios, all of our advisors, myself included, will have money in them and we will be paying the same 1% fee. So we're not even doing the best thing for you. We're also, we're all in it together, right? That's really important to me because I know like when people are like, are you a fiduciary? I'm like, yeah, I'm a fiduciary. But by the way, you have no idea that that standard is like BS. It has no teeth. No. It should have teeth. It should. I totally agree. Like the way I get the intention of it and it should be, but what can happen in practice with a fiduciary is still a lot of stuff that doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. So stackers hear us right. We're not saying that being a fiduciary is bad. We're saying that you can ask that question all you want and people will openly lie to you, just mm -hmm. openly lie to you, or they'll tell you that, oh, well, you know, and squirm around it. Mm -hmm. That's not a question. And by the way, we assume people are fiduciaries in the CFP defense. I love this commercial from CFP, which will lead to how do we interview people? But listen to this, Shannon, people might remember this commercial. Let me talk to you about retirement. A 401k is the most sound way to go. Let's talk asset allocation. Sure. You seem knowledgeable, professional. Would you trust me as your financial advisor? I would. I would indeed. Well, let's be clear here. I'm actually a DJ. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I have no financial experience at all. That really is you. If they're not a CFP pro, you just don't know. Find a certified financial planner professional who's thoroughly vetted at letsmakeaplan.org. CFP. All right. So CFP has, has, but they do have a point there. People are judging this guy on his sales pitch, right? Yeah. He says the right terms. He does. He makes the right move. He's wearing a suit. Yeah. If you can say jargon with confidence, then yeah, I, I totally know what that commercial is. It's like he just said jargon confidently. <laughs> but it happens all the time. And there were so many times when, and don't get me wrong, I, I think I was really good at my job, but people would tell me, well, you're the one person I talked to. I didn't talk to anybody. First of all, what interview questions should we ask that people aren't asking? The one I love is how do you invest your own money? And can I see your investment portfolio? I love mm. that one because when I was at Merrill Lynch, I saw it all the time. Guys would invest their own money one way and in certain products and like laddered CDs and stuff like that. And then they would invest their clients in, you know, C-share funds and like structured notes and all these things that I know have a lot of fees in them. And I was like, Okay, do your clients know? And I, and I would say to them, like, how how do you sleep at night? Like, how do you how do you do this? And obviously, they slept really fine, and they were okay with it. But it never sat well with me. And I I would tell clients to ask me that. I said because this is a person who's investing your money. And I would say I don't think they have to have a lot of money, right? They could black out their investments, or they could be transparent, and say I'm building wealth, or I don't have it. But that person's thinking about for themselves, like, why would they do something differently for you? And I because I just see it all the time. And that's why I said it's really important for us here to eat what we're serving, because I want you to sleep at night. I'm not going to sleep at night because I'm going to worry about your portfolio. But that's not your job. And this is the thing that frustrates me. People hire a financial advisor because they need help or whatever. Or a lot of times we say, we're hearing this from clients. They also really want to be educated, too. You know, they sure. want to know what's happening, especially the younger generations. They want to know. And what I've seen is that advisors don't really want to educate their clients or a, maybe they don't know how because they've just been reading the script so long and maybe they don't even know what they're saying. Yeah. But two, they have this fear that if their client knows more, that they don't need them. And what I say is our clients actually need us more. The way I think about it and I'm telling our clients is like, look, if we're going to invest for you, we're driving the car. OK, we're we have discretionary authority in your accounts. We are driving the car, but we want you next to us like we want you as our ride or die. We want you in the front seat. We want to explain where we're going to whatever degree you want. But we want you to learn and know, because we know that even though you'll know everything that we're talking about, you'll understand asset allocation, why we've got dividend paying stocks in here or not. We want you to know that that doesn't mean you want to drive the car. Yeah. Just because our clients have knowledge and they get what's happening doesn't mean they still want to drive the car. They want us to do it. I love that analogy. I used to use a similar one that, you know, your money's like your sheep. I'm a good shepherd, but they're your damn sheep. They're not mm -hmm. my sheep. Yeah. And so you got to know how this works. And if, by the way, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, 
I want you to be better off with your sheep than before I arrived. We had a guy in town who always said that he wanted to educate clients. And then in the early days, before I knew him really well, we'd go to lunch because he was one of the few people I knew who was in the industry when we moved to Texarkana. And he would just constantly complain about his clients were calling him, asking him how stuff worked. And I'm like, didn't you say you wanted to educate yeah. people? <laughs> if you teach people how to fish, and this is the thing we've been doing at the financial gym for the last 10 years, we're educating them on their investments. Like we haven't been investing for them, but we've been educating them. And what happens is when we've had huge market disruptions the last few years, our clients aren't calling us crying. Our clients are like, it's on sale now. I should buy it, right? Yeah. Because we've educated them, you, you know, there's a lot of advisors out there when markets go wacky and it's scary and the, there's a lot of volatility. Great time they're... to sell annuities. Yeah. <laughs> there's always, it's always, a, always be selling annuities, right? There's, there's <laughs> people who feel like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but those are the times when the clients are calling the advisor because they're stressed because they haven't been prepared for what's going to happen. And and they're stressed out. And if you just advise your client, like we tell our clients, it's putting your money on a roller coaster. It is not in a checking out. You are going to, it's going to go up and down. It is supposed to. That is how investing works. It, and some roller coasters are more extreme. There's some that are in between and some are kiddie coasters, but like it's going to happen. And so you just have to prepare for that, especially younger generation, like Gen Z's and millennials. This demographic has a lot of financial headwinds. And under investing and not going aggressive enough in these early stages when they need to because they're afraid is not a good look. Yeah. For them. They need to be aggressive. Yeah, you should be afraid of the fact that your money's not going to be enough. Not yeah. afraid of the roller coaster. What I love is that, and I think you're focused, use that roller coaster analogy is advisors telling you what type of roller coaster you're on and that yeah. it's okay. This has been right. tested. This is a yeah. time tested roller coaster. You're not going to die on this roller coaster. And yeah. uh, we're going to, you know, th 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 thousands of people make it through this roller coaster every year. The only way you die, just like in a regular roller coaster, is if you jump off too soon. Jump off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've had those thoughts before. I mean, I'm, I'm not even talking about the stock market because I've had those too. But on a real roller coaster, I'm like, I just want to, can, can I get Why off? Why did I like, do this? Yeah. Why yes. did I do this? <laughs> Usually about three quarters of the way up that hill, right? You're like, holy yeah. cow. Exactly. Yeah. What did I do to myself? <laughs> What should I have already handled before I go looking for advice? We get this question all the time, Shannon. Like, do I need to have some of the basics down? Do I, what should I have known ahead of time? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's what are you reaching out to the advisor for? Why do you feel like you needed a third party there? Are you looking for financial planning, like somebody who's going to put all the pieces of the puzzle together for you? Or are you looking for somebody who's just going to invest? They're just going to do one piece of your puzzle and you've got the rest of the piece together. And then also what monies would they invest and how? Because, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, retirement. There's other investment opportunities, but other than retirement accounts. And how are we planning for that? And for us, I don't love paying somebody just to manage your investments. I don't feel like that's a great use of somebody's money. But now if you're paying and they're going to look at all the puzzle pieces and be true financial planners and say, I'm going to I'm going to worry about insurance for you. There is good insurance. There is insurance at the right times. I'm going to think about how you're saving. I'm going to think about how much you should be making. I'm going to help you plan for where you're going, all this kind of stuff. If you're doing that, then, yeah, that person's doing a lot of work for you. And I think that fee is worth it. But. Again, what do you need them to do and can they do that? Like, we, I, I've talked to a number of people in this process of, of us setting up our RAA that have said to me, I want to bring my money to you guys once you open the doors because I've asked my advisor, especially the last few years with inflation going up, a number of people have said, I've asked my advisor for help with budgeting. And they've said, no, we don't do that here. Wow. Okay. Well, there are advisors who will help you with budgeting. I think that's really important to understand when you're going into the relationship, what are you expecting out of it? and I think you should expect a lot of the relationship. That's a good point. Lots of advisors do different things to be clear mm -hmm. about what you're actually getting for the money. It drives me crazy when I see people say, well, the first thing you get to ask is what they charge. And the first thing to ask is, what do I get? Yeah. And then do the fee and go, okay, is this a reasonable number? Because to your yeah. point, 1% for some people, I, I know people that are screwing people when they charge 1%. I know mm -hmm. other people that are delivering so much service that 1% is a phenomenally low fee, right. phenomenally low because they're adding yeah. to the bottom line. That brings up another topic, by the way, as you were talking, when you're talking about there are good insurance products, I think generally for me, you know, we talked about these bad advisors, that one advisor you talked about at the top of this discussion Really, people that lead with product, I think, are people you need to avoid, yeah. right? If they start answering your question with, oh, we got this product, you're like, what do you know about me? Like, yeah. start with process. 
Right. We, I, I said, um, we had one client say that, that she was talking to a guy and he was like, yeah, and we'll, we invest in Tesla. And she's like, okay, I could buy Tesla on my own, you know, like, okay, that's so great. I'm going to love that. I mean, some of the stories I've been hearing, because we've, I've been talking to some of our clients about this is, is crazy. What I say is, we're financial planners at the end of the day. We're looking at all the pieces and stuff. And I said, I like to think of our adult lives like a road trip from New York to California. And New York is starting out and California's retirement. It's our job to get you from New York to California, make all the stops along the way you want to make and live in the house you want to live in when you get to California. Part of the process is knowing what stops are we going to make. I say, if you want to have a kid, kid is Disney World. That is Orlando. That is the ultimate expensive off the beaten path detour to California. I have one of those. I did one trip. I'm good. But like, great. OK, we want to do that. Well, maybe we're not going to see Seattle. Maybe we won't see Chicago. But as long as you know, and I've told you and you're prepared, then great. You want to start a business. OK, that might set you back up to Vermont. You've got student loan debt. Maybe we're starting in Canada. I don't care where you're starting. It's where you want to go. And having a good financial planner and somebody who is driving the car and knows all the things that come together. I tell clients, we want you to get you to financial independence, which is Colorado, right? Like, let's not try to get to California. Let's get to Colorado and then have fun. To your point, Joe, it's like, what is a product going to do if you don't know where somebody's going? And that's what I tell clients. I can't invest for you. I can't give you any advice if I don't know where we're going on this road trip, because that's half the battle. That's why all the stories we shared at the top were about square pegs, round holes. Well, that and people ripping people off. I guess guess maybe a little bit. And by the way, as a side note, I will still state here for the record, Shannon, people don't even know we've talked about this. You don't like Disney because you did it wrong. I'm I'm just, (laughs) I've told you that 30 times. You did it wrong and you still blame the mouse. It's not the mouse's fault that you messed it up. I was so upset that I call Disney the seventh circle of hell because (laughs) it's as hot as hell in the summertime. Because it's a swamp. Well, there and you all, go. Wow, you went to Florida in the summer. And all it is is parents and kids breaking down all day long. That's all it is. <laughs> we'll fight about that later, Shannon. <laughs> you have been known in the financial gym as, as the company that doesn't handle money for other people. A lot of people don't know what an RIA is. But now you will be handling money for people. Uh, why the change? Honestly, because our clients have been asking for it. So... Up to this point for the last 10 years, I say we've been backseat drivers. You know, we just, hey, you know, in the, in the journey, we're like, here's an idea. And when it comes to investing, we've just had to send our clients off to robos or their parents. We're calling them the Garys. Their parents, Gary, <laughs> or having to do it themselves and making some questionable choices. And we've just had to sit in the back seat, kind of like, mm, I wish they would let us drive the car. And our clients have been asking us for it. So we've spent the last 10 years building our clients' wealth, helping them overcome, get out of debt cycles, start having first generational wealth or, you know, building their own wealth. And it's a natural next stop is like, can you manage my wealth or help me with this? Because I don't want to drive the car in this part of it. Like I'm driving it in the rest of my life. Like I'm, you know, saving, I'm doing my job, I'm doing all these other things. Can you drive the car? So it's honestly been out of massive demand from our clients. And I think it's uh, wild that this is the last stop for you where financial planning was first, because the biggest misunderstanding that I see, well, in our own basement Facebook group is people going, well, I can beat an advisor with an S&P 500 fund. I'm like, you clearly don't know what an advisor does Mm -mm. because you've been doing financial planning forever and having zero to do with the S&P 500 or an index. I saw this when I was at Merrill Lynch and this is why I left Merrill for the gym, because I would do plans for people and I would say, okay. Here's what the market's going to give you. Let's just say six to seven percent on average over time. I need you to be saving. Right. And here's what you're going to do. And what I would say is like, so if I'm asking you to save a thousand dollars, your investment portfolio is going to make what, 60 to 70 dollars a year. If I could get you to save a hundred dollars a year, that's a 10 percent return. If I could get you to save 500, that's a 50 percent. Like having the money is the hardest part. The investing is easy. I just met with clients. They've been my clients for seven years. They came to me because they were doing it on their own. Their husband invested in a penny stock with their retirement accounts and a brokerage account, (laughs) went to zero, bankrupt, right? Yeah. Company went bankrupt. So they, I think they lost, officially lost, it was something like seven or $80,000. Oh no. Close to divorce, right? So they, they joined the gym. We get things in line. They put the pieces in place. They started with 300,000 in net worth. These are two W2 employees. They don't have a business. They're just doing the thing. Parents with two kids. 
We just checked in seven years later. They are up 1.6 million in net worth in seven years. And you know what a large contributor is that is me as their financial planner, not letting them spend as they've had raises and putting more money in over time and having the money to put in. That's been half the battle. Not I mean, yes, they've been getting market returns because they've been investing it. But yeah, but that's not the driver. Nope. I can't tell you how many times I've met people and they're like, oh, I got this phenomenal investing strategy. And then I ask, oh, that's fantastic. Like, you know, not thinking it's really fantastic, but but just (laughs) wanted to keep the conversation going and go, yeah, that's great. How much money are you doing it with? And people, oh, just, you know, just getting ready to start. Saving money, huge driver, huge, huge Yeah, saving money is my phenomenal, is the Jim's phenomenal investment strategy. That's how we feel. That's such, such a driver. Uh, How do people get a hold of you guys if they want to dive in, if they want more? Yeah, financialgym.com. You could schedule a free warm-up call to learn more about either our coaching or advisory or both. And our warm-up, I always say our warm-up calls are free of cost and judgment. So let us know and and that nobody it's our, our, I love our warm-up call team they're our current clients so it's a way for them to make side hustle money and oh. who knows our product more than our clients using it so they are not incented to sell they're just incented to tell you about the business I love the terminology you use the warm-up call I, I yeah. love how all of this is all thought out to be warm and friendly something that the financial industry frankly is not lacking <laughs> <So>. yeah <laughs> <laughs> could, could maybe have a little more of Shada McClay. Thanks for hanging out with us and mentoring us on finding good advisors. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Hey, this is Lou Mangello from WW Radio. And now when I'm not at Walt Disney World or sharing my passion for Disney World or eating, I am stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Shannon for hanging out with us. OG, word fiduciary means nothing. So discouraging. Well, Again, it doesn't mean nothing. It just is used incorrectly well, all the time. Okay. So, yes. And some real ugliness there. It doesn't make it bad, but it's uh, everybody uses it wrong. So till the SEC or somebody actually gives a crap about definitions and starts, you know, there's a guy that advertises here in Dallas on TV all the time. And like literally he uses that word. And then in the next ad talks about all of the uh, uh, bonus annuities that you can buy. <laughs> don't get me wrong you could be a fiduciary and sell annuities but i've never met one who does in theory they exist it's like a you know the loch ness monster or yeah. you know a black swan supposedly they're around but um he's not spending money on on tv to advertise annuities to not get a commission like it costs a lot of money to have an ad on tv dude wants to get paid can't do both buddy can't be both which goes back to her great advice. You know, the discussion has to be around strategy, not around uh, and making you smarter, not around around product. Hey, time for one stacker who'd better call Saul. See hi and OG. This is the part of the show where we help a stacker in need. And today we are going to help out Paul. Hey, Paul. Hello, Basement Nerds. This is Paul, and I have an order of operations question for you. My employer puts a percentage of my salary into a 401a account, and additional contributions into that account are not allowed from me. But I have access to an HSA, a 457b, a 403b, and then my Roth IRA. Across those four accounts, I could sock away $57,150 in total according to the 2024 limits. While I technically could max out all these accounts, I don't want to live quite that frugal of a lifestyle. You got to enjoy the journey, right? I have been and plan to continue to max out the Roth IRA and the HSA account. After that, it's my understanding that it is better to fund the 457B over the 403B, mostly because if I retire early or leave my current employer, I can access that money penalty-free. I have a stable employer, so I'm not really concerned about their solvency and the funds in the 457 or the 403 accounts being at risk. What do you think about the order of HSA, Roth IRA, then 457B, and then the 403B if I end up being able to fill the 457B. Do you think I should consider something outside of these options, like a regular taxable brokerage account? I appreciate your thoughts on this and all that you guys do. Oh, and Doug, if you want, this torso is willing to support Doug 2024. I will be traveling to a few states and a few countries this year between now and November. Fantastic. Oh, you know what, Paul? We will definitely support you supporting Doug with a run. By the way, for people wondering what that's all about, when you call in, we send you some swag. Normally, it's a Greatest Money Show on Earth shirt, but Paul, we are proud to have a candidate who just, uh, what is, what's the tagline, Doug? Not crooked at all. Yes. 
there it is. Very much a straight arrow when it comes to heading to the buffet. Everybody knows they can trust me. <laughs> He's a straight arrow to the refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OG, Paul getting granular about these different accounts. Let's start here. He starts off with the Roth IRA out of all these. So this is the one that really has the backwards taxability, meaning that not a big tax relief plan today, but a tax shelter that's going to be tax free forever, as long as he follows the Roth IRA rules. So do you like starting there? Well, I think we have to acknowledge a, one thing that's different about uh, about his situation here versus other people's is that the vast majority of people who have a workplace retirement plan, think 401k, require contributions in order to get company matching contributions. And what he said at the very beginning was, was that his organization gives matching contributions without him having to do anything. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's kind of why this is a little screwier than the normal way, which is you got to put some money in your workplace plan and then, you know, do the rest later. So what he's saying is, is that Mike, you know, his company contributes money to the matching program, which is what the 401A is. That's basically the match account for his retirement accounts. So they're putting money in there regardless of whether or not he puts any money in the workplace plan. So he's taking their free money and then he's putting money in the Roth IRA. Obviously the Roth IRA is taxable already. It's already after tax money and that money is going to be tax free for life. Knock on wood until Congress changes it, which they haven't yet. I don't think they will, but you never know. And the HSA of course is used for healthcare expenses. And we talk a little bit about having uh, the ability to use it for additional things post 65, you know, without penalty. So those two places work out to be, depending on if you're, if you're single or married, anywhere between $11,000 and fifteen or $16,000 a year. So then the next question is, is where should I put the rest of the money? Should I put it in the 403B or should I put it in the 457? And again, the, this is kind of unique. You don't see both of these things very often, but in this unique case, actually can do both retirement accounts. He could literally put $23,000 into the 457 and $23,000 into the 403B and max out a Roth and max out an HSA and get a company match. So a lot of people would look at that as being pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, oh, shucks. I have to, you know, defer more money, but you know, you have to work on cash flow, and that's what he's talking about. Like I could do it, but I don't want to be that frugal. And what he's boiled down to here is the difference between a 403B and a 457. Really, the biggest difference is, like you mentioned, the liquidity in terms of the penalty-free access. If it's a pre-tax account, you're always going to pay taxes on it when it comes out. It's just whether or not you pay a penalty on when it comes out. Before 59 and a half, there's a 10% penalty. After 59 and a half, there's not for a 403B. For a 457, no 10% penalty as long as you retire. So to his point, it offers a little bit more liquidity. The downside is that that 457 isn't your money. It's the organization's money. So if they go belly up or get sued or whatever, it's part of the organization's assets and could be taken away. And no one thinks that it's going to happen. I can't think of an example in which it has because it's usually government entities or public school systems or whatever. But I can think of scenarios that it could happen. There was a viciously awful school shooting in Texas several years ago, such that they, just, you know, shut the school down. They, they demolished the school and it became news again here lately in Texas and maybe nationally because the, the feds finally released their report. And there's all these failures of the first responders to, to do what they're supposed to do. And now you're seeing a lot of lawsuits being added to the already big lawsuit calendar, you know, with the people in charge and the school district and that sort of thing. This is not going to be an inexpensive settlement, and it shouldn't be. But if you've got a 457 as part of that school district, that money is part of the school district money, you know. So I can see scenarios. I haven't seen it yet, but I can see scenarios where this money could be affected by outside influences. So you have to know that that's what you're getting into. Well, here's here's the question. You know, he likes the 457 better than the 403B because of his uh, flexibility, but is the 403B completely inflexible? If he decides to go early, can he still get at some of that money? Yeah. I mean, ultimately you can always get your retirement money without a penalty if you're actually retiring. So the IRS doesn't care that you take your money out of your retirement accounts. They care that you take it out when you're not supposed to. So if you're retiring, you're 45 
and you're like, no, I'm retired. There's a provision for how to take money out of your workplace plans without a penalty because you're retired. There is the ability to do it. It's a lot less paperwork to do it out of 457. The last thing I would say about it is this. Usually the investment choices or the investment companies between these two are vastly different. 403Bs, habitually annuity products, generally speaking, doesn't make them bad, but does make them a little bit more expensive. 457s are generally mutual fund products. Doesn't make them bad, generally a little bit more expensive than, you know, an ETF low cost portfolio. So I think that's another consideration here is to look and see which investments select, which pool has a better cost profile because they're both probably going to suck, but you have to figure out which one sucks less. I think personally, because of the liability issue, all things being equal, I would probably lean on the 403B because it's my money. I don't ever have to worry about it going away for some obscure reason. And if I do retire before 59 and a half, I can have access to it with a little bit of paperwork. That doesn't scare me. So given the choice, I take 403B uh, if everything else was about the same. I love just looking in on your thought process on that because there's so many different factors. And uh, Paul, I hope that was helpful because really, and I love the question of, What's my order of operation? If I do have these different uh, things, these different levers that I've explored and that I can can go to, which one makes sense to use first, second, third? It's a it's a great question. And well, and the, I'll give you one. I was gonna say I'll give you one other idea. Is let's say that for example, you're 40 years old and you're thinking, well, I'm not really thinking about early retirement, but 55 would be great. Why not do your contributions mostly into the 403b and just enough into the 457? to provide you with that 55 through 59 and a half year flexibility. You know, you could back into how much money do I need from 55 to 59 and a half, start saving that now and say, well, I'm going to, instead of doing all my money in the 43B or all my money in the 457, say, well, I'm going to put, you know, 80% in my 43B and 20% in my 457. So that when I retire at 55, I've got that four year bucket ready to rock and roll. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of cut this up, you know, depending on costs and your flexibility and you know, that sort of thing. Awesome. Thank you for the question, Paul. If you've got a question for us, head to stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail, and uh, we will answer your question as well. And Paul, mom's friend Gertrude is going to send you a code so that you can head to Flying Pork Apparel and pick out your own Doug 2024 campaign shirt and wear that proudly, man, as you, uh, as you rock your Stacky Benjamins wear. Uh, maybe at some campaign rallies. Imagine how great it'll feel when you get the knowing glance for you know, wearing your Doug 2024 t-shirt out and about and somebody's like, hey, and when you realize somebody else knows that little inside who Doug is, that's a feeling that cannot be beaten. You know, the other feeling that cannot be beaten is the feeling that you've got great financial help in your corner. And that's, and that's why... It's made the worst. <laughs> no, that actually is one of the better segues you've done. I'm thinking, man, did I serve that up well to him? That was pretty good. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, if you are here not <laughs> because you need to make better financial decisions, head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. And that leads to his team's calendar and uh, is the road to better financial outcomes in uh, 2024 in the future. Stackybenjamins.com slash OG. And now it's time before we say goodbye to wander out on the back porch and talk about our community. Well, lots of people, Doug, talking about some of our recent shows. A discussion, first of all, by Dolly. Karen brings up, we had some trivia about Dolly Parton mm -hmm, and about how mm -hmm. amazing her book program is. Dolly Parton announced... That for her employees pursuing higher education, they would be covering tuition costs, fees, and books for everyone in her organization. Of course, there was another discussion about Dolly and our trivia, which was on the number of books that her organization has given away. And some of our stackers have actually received books from Dolly's organization. Stacker Andy, who lives in Vermont, says Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is a great program. 
Enrolled kids receive a book every month till their fifth birthday. There are paperback editions printed for the program, summer classics like The Little Engine That Could, some are new titles. They're often are printed in English and Spanish. It's fun to annoy my kids by reading <laughs> the Spanish text. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, Andy's not that great at the Spanish. And man, we had we had a few uh, a few stackers. Nathan says it's a great program. Got books for the last five years, but no books from neighbor Doug. Dolly, send them books. You're not Doug. Maybe you need to work <laughs> not, on that. I still love to read them all. KT says my son gets a book every month. He's two and a half years old now. Our little engine that could was hardback and the first book he received we enjoy reading them and uh ashley says we enrolled our son in this when he's born in september looking forward to reading him the books free books from from dolly pardons organization yeah another great discussion that's happening in the basement joe is regarding a friday episode from a couple of weeks ago with uh where maggie tucker was our guest and we talked about cost of living in a city versus maybe not a city out in the burbs or out, out in the country. And that really got a lot of people talking about different pros and cons of it. So that was a really fun discussion to watch happen in the. Yeah, I was super happy because when I picked the piece, which uh, Carrie mentioned was <laughs> Carrie mentioned what I mentioned, which was the piece was a little light. It was right. basically don't don't live in the city. <laughs> and I kind of took exception to that. I don't even live in a big city, but I was like, really? I was hoping that that would resonate. And I'm glad with a lot of our stackers that, that it did, but truly, Oh gee, this is about, you have to take advantage of where you live. Like if you're going to live in a place, don't just live there, you know, like drive in your drive there. Yeah. Live there. Damn it. <laughs> right. Be a part of don't that. Just live there. Don't just be there. Live there. Community. Carrie said she lives in San Francisco, which Doug, uh, you call San Fran. Yeah. Because everybody calls it San Fran. Yes. Yeah, but you're supposed to call it SF. It was. That's, well, what, all the, that's what all the well, cool people say. Yes. And Jane, Jane points that out that uh, Doug, you, Doug, you messed that up. It was funny. I was listening to the Lions game last week before the big game last weekend with San Francisco. <laughs> the big Lions fan couldn't even make it to a bar or his own house to watch the game. Instead, was just driving around listening to it on the old AM 760 WJR. <laughs> I, 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 I like listening to Dan Miller, number one. I think he paints a fantastic picture. He's great at it. But second was, I was on my way home from a nice getaway weekend in Houston and uh, made sure that I was on the road. They don't have any, you know... They probably do. I didn't want to get home any later. I wanted to get my. So get you're home. talking about two weeks ago when they played the Bucks. Yes. Okay. When they played the Buccaneers at the end of the game, Lomas Brown, their color commentator, said, "Everybody, we're going to San Fran," and I immediately thought, "Jane's going to hate you," because <laughs> <laughs> nobody calls it San Fran, Lomas. Except everybody, and everybody on the show was calling it. So maybe it's the Detroiter in us. I don't know. But back to this piece, Carrie said that, you know, she lives very nicely on $35,000, $36,000 a year. In 2022, lived on $36,000. Last year, she spent a whopping $41,000. She actually said she's going to cut back from $41,000 living in a high-cost living area like San Francisco. Wow. And she loves it. Wow. Got to live where you where I think you, you got to have experiences on both ends of that. I would suggest trying 40000 a month just to see what you think about that lifestyle. <laughs> Give it a whirl for a year, then decide. <laughs> hey, Carrie, why don't you just YOLO this and, and you know, next month, just go ahead and blow the annual budget and just then see how it feels. Yeah, yeah. See how much I did learn that when I was in Houston, I went to the museum of fine arts and do you know how much great art around the world was created by people that were into debt by their eyeballs? Like I felt like as I was reading about so many artists, they're like, yeah, uh, he had to sell this painting so he could get food to live. It's amazing how some of the greatest pieces in history were created out of desperation. That's the power of compounding. Yeah. So Carrie, what we're saying is if you blow 40 grand in a month, you might be in the Museum of Fine Art after that thanks to everybody who participated in that by the way if you want to join our little community online it's the stacky benjamin's basement if you just go to stacky benjamins.com slash basement you'll see a url there a link that will take you right to our facebook group you'll apply to get in and uh, we'd love to have you join the chat too all right i think that's gonna put a pin in it for today on wednesday the amazing kimberly hamilton who i met at this year's fincon joins us 
she's going to talk through the amazingly personal experience of, of buying a house and different for everybody, but there are some rules if you're going to be a homeowner that you should follow. And Kimberly's going to walk us through some great financial management tips while we talk about buying a house. So whether you're looking for better ways to just manage your money or you're thinking about buying a home, we got you covered on Wednesday and more. And the joke off is back, Doug, on Wednesday, of course. <sighs> the next round. Yeah. All right. That's going to do it for today, except this. Doug, what's on our to-do list? Well, Joe, what's been stacked up on our to-do list today? First, take some advice from Shannon McClay. While the fiduciary question sounds great, you're going to have to dig deeper. Does the advisor start with a process? How do they work towards helping you think better about your goals? Those are keys to winning. And you need advisors who help you win, and not just who are selling products. Second, the Chinese economy looks like a buy because it's low. Stocks are low for a reason. And better to know that reason and think what could go wrong rather than trust that you're going to be right while all the pros think the opposite. So what's the biggest to do? Never, ever tell Joe's mom you think you could bench press her. She won't let you try and she'll somehow take it as an insult when you reassure her that you can lift a woman of her size. It's not a great phrase to use. Thanks to Shannon McLay for joining us today. You can find out more about the Financial Gym at financialgym.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show is written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, Kate Youngkin, Karen Repine, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course you do, but you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of the show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing going for this podcast. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude, Stacy Doe, and Julia Garib are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. For more interactive fun, join us on Instagram every Tuesday and Thursday for our Instagram Lives. Kate Yonkin and Joe host those weekly. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Stacking Benjamins.